Are you ready? See you red. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Fireside Chat is back. It's our late June edition, and we've got a lot to cover. Uh, we had a, quite a memorable NHL draft. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. How you doing, buddy? Eh, all right. You know, this last week has been just okay for Flames fans. Not much news at all. Excited by the moves that were made at the draft? Oh, absolutely. I think that trade that Treleving made will cement the Flames as a top-tier contender for years to come. We'll get to that, but first let's start with kind of going chronologically of what's happened since we were on together last. Uh, let's talk about the NHL awards. Uh, did you watch the awards show? Uh, unfortunately not. I was watching it for the first time. I think this is the first time I've ever watched the awards, and I was kind of disappointed how Hollywood-like it seemed. It seemed very Oscars-like in the way they did it, and I guess if they're putting it on TV, it has to be. But I don't know, it just seemed kind of cheesy to me. But for those that don't know... Uh, the Flames walked away with two pieces of hardware. Yari Hoodler won the Lady Bing. And I don't know if you saw his acceptance speech, but the most odd odd speech I've ever seen. And Bob Hartley walked away with the Jack Adams Award. Unfortunately, Johnny Gaudreau did not win the Calder Trophy, and Mark Giordano did not win the NHL Foundation Award, which I never even heard of before this. Yeah, neither have I. So, Matt, uh, thoughts on Hoodler and Hartley's wins? I was actually shocked that Hoodler won it uh, just because of who he was going up against in the nominations, but he definitely deserved it. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I did not expect him to win that award. Um, it was definitely kind of surprising looking at who who they had, who was um, you know available to win it, and yeah, I was I did not expect to see his name brought up for that one. Yeah, and it's actually kind of interesting that uh, Sean Monahan was actually fifth in the voting and Gaudreau was in the top 20. And I think it's interesting that Pavel Datsuk was right there, a former teammate of his who he beat out. Yeah. I guess uh, we can rename the first line the killing them with kindness line. And then no surprise to me that Bob Hartley won Jack Adams. I think we were worried that perhaps he might not because of the votes from the East. But I think he was definitely the most deserving coach, so I'm glad to see that got rewarded. Yeah. For me, there wasn't anybody else in the league that did as much for their team as Hartley, so I wasn't shocked. Like it, Even though uh, the other two coaches had excellent seasons, Calgary was expected to be a bottom five team right around where Edmonton and Buffalo are, and the fact that... the the Flames not only made the playoffs, but advanced to the second round. Like, he got everything out of everybody on the team. Yeah, and you and I talked about this earlier in the year, too. And, I mean, you know, we, we I had pointed out how I think that you could take a lot of the coaches currently in the NHL and you could kind of shuffle them around and put those coaches behind the same benches and you would have got some of success. I think if you look at it, Hartley took a team that everybody expected to be at the bottom and got the best out of them and he definitely deserves recognition for that yeah exactly like the rangers are a dynamite team and they would have been whether Vino was there or not yeah exactly and i think too with bob hartley it's a great story this guy who got kind of you know won a stanley cup went to atlanta then got exiled from the league for a bit and comes back and makes such a dramatic impact i think it, it it's a great story as well I thought it was interesting in Hoodler's, um, Hoodler's speech when he mentioned the Flames marketing team. That's not something that we hear a lot. So I thought that was kind of an interesting uh, an interesting group to thank. Yeah, well, it, he did a nice thing and good shout out for Peter Hanlon and all that. So yeah, I'm I'm not surprised by the, by the Hartley win. The other one was sort of surprising, and I am surprised that uh, Giordano didn't win the NHL Foundation Award. It seemed like I don't know. It, it kind of seemed like maybe the, he was getting that nod partly because he got injured and wasn't eligible for you know other awards. So I'm kind of surprised he didn't win that one. With Gaudreau not winning the Calder, I wasn't actually shocked, mainly because uh, Aaron Ekblad, he did have an absolutely dynamite season for the Florida Panthers, 
But what I was shocked is that Mark Stone actually finished ahead of Gaudreau in the voting. And to me, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. No, that is weird. You know, it's one of those things that you always wonder about East Coast bias when it comes to things like that, because they would have the availability to see Stone regularly, where Gaudreau not so much. Who knows? It, it, you know, it's just one of those things that it's a little frustrating, because he definitely deserved more than finishing third in the Calder voting. Maybe it's some resentment over the Johnny Hockey moniker. Who knows? Well, after the uh, award ceremony in Vegas, then all the the brass of all the teams uh, went down to Florida. They were all in Sunrise, the home of your second favorite team, the Florida Panthers, for the NHL entry draft. And going in, I mean, if you listen to interviews with uh, Trill Living right up until almost the day of the draft, he said, oh, we're going to pick at 15th. And when I saw the trade come down, I was really surprised they traded their first pick, their first round pick, much less uh, their first and second rounds in such a deep draft. What were your thoughts when you first saw that they'd move those three? Well, when I heard that the trade call uh, with happened and Hamilton was a flame, everybody was wondering what the flames gave up. And yeah. I think everybody was freaking out, hoping that wasn't Gaudreau or Bennett or somebody you know, that's a top tier player on the Flames. And when it came down that it was just draft picks, I personally started laughing, going, What? How how did True Living pull that one off? And like this draft is a a fairly deep one and adding a guy like Kyle Connor in the first round would have been great had the Flames kept the pick. But anytime you can get a franchise caliber defenseman that's six foot five and a right shooting player like Dougie Hamilton, give me a break. That's a no brainer. Uh, who cares about the picks? Yeah, and and I think that's you know that's a good way to look at it. And for those that don't know, the full trade was uh, the Calgary Flames traded picks 15, 45, and fifty two in this draft to the Boston Bruins for Dougie Hamilton. And I think to me, the benefit that I saw right away was the Flames were able to acquire such a, a strong young defenseman and give up no roster player, no tangible asset. You know, as much as you might think this is a great draft, you never really know how those guys are going to turn out. So to me, when you can get a player who's 22, is about, you know, three, maybe four years older than the player you're you're getting and probably the age of the player when he'd make the NHL and you know what you're getting out of that asset, it's a calculated risk that I think was worth taking. Oh yeah, for sure. Like to me it was a no brainer. And especially because he fits a, the exact thing that the Flames need. A huge right shooting defenseman. The Flames don't have a lot of defense in the system pushing to actually make the roster. So getting Hamilton is huge for the Flames. And, like, all season, like, I was hoping that the Flames would target, like, this year's version of Nick Letty from last year. And Hamilton definitely fits the bill. A little bit about Dougie Hamilton, for those that don't know. He's a six foot five, 212-pound defenseman. He shoots right. He was born June 17th, 1993, which means he just turned 22, and he's from Toronto. Uh, he was drafted in the first round, ninth overall, by Boston in 2012. And he's really only played three seasons at the NHL level, so still a young guy, but I think a guy who's really going to make the top four here in Calgary that much more interesting. And I think, really, if you look at it, Giordano is going to be on the downswing in a couple of years, and a one-two pair, or a, you know, one-two of Hamilton and Brody is going to be quite exciting to watch. Yeah, and Hamilton actually had a single point more than Brody did this year, and having two players that are as talented as Brody and Hamilton moving forward, that they will become the Calgary version of uh, Duncan Keith and Brent Seabrook. If you look at what those, what the Seabrook Keith pairing have done, that's been the talk of the NHL for years. Exactly, and with Brody being under contract for long, a long term, I think 
six years and hopefully Hamilton gets signed for six or seven years. Like, that'll be the foundation that the Flames can have moving forward. And, like, if to draw comparisons to Chicago, Mark Giordano now will fill the role of Brian Campbell back when Chicago won the Cup the first time, although Giordano's on a whole different tier than Campbell was. At six foot five and 215 pounds, Hamilton is now the biggest defender on the Flames blue line, though not the biggest in the organization. That honor goes to six foot six, 240 pound Keegan Kanzig. Uh, but Hamilton is one of only three natural right-handed shots under contract at the pro level. The others are Weidman and England. So sort of an an interesting note there. Yeah, and getting that basically takes all the pressure off of all the prospects that we have on the defense because you now have a solid top five that are good and should be readily available to play for another couple of seasons at least. Flames fans haven't got to see Dougie Hamilton a lot, being that he's been in the East, but um, another interesting stat about him is since 2005, he's one of only 25 NHL defenders who scored more than 40 points and played more than 20 minutes in a season under the age of 22. That list contains mostly stars such as Bo Meester, Drew Doughty, Oliver ekman Larson, uh, Peter Angelo, Shea Weber, and Eric Carlson. The only dubious name on that list is Cam Barker. So, good company to be in. Anytime you can be on a list with those kind of guys, you know you're getting a quality player. Well, additionally, like if you look at the advanced statistics and all that, um, Hamilton was the best player for Boston in that department, and he did play less minutes, but if you compare him to Mark Giordano, they're almost identical. It's just that Hamilton only played like 22, 23 minutes a night, where Giordano was playing 26, 27. So he's already very comparable to Giordano in terms of ability, and who knows how much better he will get. And on top of that, uh, carrying on with what you were saying about the 25 defensemen that had more than 40 points, for the age 21 season, only P.K. Subban has actually had a better age 21 season than Hamilton since the year 2000. Wow. So he really is one of the top young players in the NHL. I'll admit that I wasn't home on Friday night watching the draft. I was at uh, my brother's wedding rehearsal. So I was kind of following it on my phone. And as soon as I got a notice on my phone that Flames trade first three draft picks, I thought, oh, crap, what have we done? And then when I read it, I still, I don't know, it took me a little bit of time to come around that, yeah, this is a good deal. And I think maybe it's because we've talked so much about how this was a generational draft. I thought at first maybe the Flames had given up too much. What were your immediate thoughts on the trade? Immediate thoughts was home run, grand slam. Uh, honestly, like I like the draft. I like all the players in the draft in the first three rounds. There are so many quality players, and even the players that Boston ended up taking, I think will all become quality NHL players. But the Flames do need an immediate impact because of the fact that I do believe that the Flames window for being a cup contender starts now. And I think that the Flames have a good shot of actually winning the cup this season now. Well, even even with that in mind, I mean, at 22, there's a guy that could be here for a long time. So whether we're you know, going to be in the playoffs or winning the cup again or not this year. I mean, here's a guy that even uh, I think up till he's 30 could be a huge part of our blue line. Exactly. And now you don't have the worry of like, oh, is Watherspoon going to develop? Is Morrison or a couple of the picks that we had this year? And, and, and even on the pro side, is Smead coming back? Like, I think it's just really given us an insurance piece, but not a depth insurance piece. This changes the face of our blue line for the better. Oh, definitely it's a home run. Uh, anytime you can add somebody like that, like uh, honestly, it's the defense equivalent of acquiring Tyler Sagan. Who do you think that Hamilton will be paired with? Well, honestly, I don't want to see the Flames break up either Giordano Brody or uh, Weidman Russell because I think they have really good chemistry. My preference would be the Flames sign another defenseman on top of that and force England to be the seventh guy. But 
I could see England being the number four guy with Hamilton. We'll see, and we'll talk later in the show about UFAs and who we see might be coming in. Um, I would be okay if the Flames wanted to try a Weidman-Hamilton pair. I think that that could work out well, and even though you know he does have good pairing with uh, or good chemistry with Chris Russell, I think that Russell, especially if you pick up another depth guy, maybe not England, but another depth guy, Russell could blend well with somebody else as well. But I think that... I don't think that I'd put, promote Russell do 3-4 over Weidman. Yeah, uh, it would really just depend on how things shake out the next week. Like, if the Flames acquire somebody, I think you go with that guy, at least to start with Hamilton, and go from there. Well, we're still talking about Hamilton. Uh, he is a restricted free agent, so technically his contract is over on July 1st. Uh, the Flames have given him a... Uh, qualifying offer, which just means that they will retain the rights on July 1st, and if they don't get the deal done, if somebody did want to sign Hamilton, we'd be getting, I think, you know, two or three first-round picks for him. So, you know, I'm I'm sure they'll get the deal done, but what kind of range, Matt, do you think we're going to see on this contract? Uh, it would depend on the years. Like, if the Flames uh, offer him the max eight years, which could be a feasibility I uh, I would expect at least six six and a half. Uh, if it's a shorter deal, I think it's less dollars. So like if he went say four years, I could see five and a half. And there's going to be a trade off there too because I believe that he's eligible for unrestricted free agency at 28. So if the Flames want to buy him right through that unrestricted free agency, that's going to cost them. Yeah, and I, that's why I think like if you had an escalating contract that say started at like four or four and a half this year, and escalated to eight or nine towards the back end, that would be fine. The number that I've seen thrown around on a couple different sites was roughly about thirty to thirty-five million dollars a year on average. So if we Take a look at that. Um, a lot of places are saying it'll probably be about a six-year deal, so that would be roughly, let's say, about $33 million over six years for a $5.5 million average. And yeah. I think that's probably a, that's probably about the right range for him. Yeah, I, I could see that, and I'd have absolutely no problem with that. I can't see us going any less than four years, but I also don't. I mean, with the talk that we've seen from Burke and Treliving lately about the salary cap and salary cap management over the next couple of years, I also can't see them going as high as eight. Well, the thing is, is that with uh, a player like Hamilton, if you did have him on a very long-term contract, that would help the Flames be a contender for a longer period because they'd have both Brody and... Hamilton under cheap contracts like we're seeing Chicago having to shed a bunch of people now because Taze and Kane are getting re-upped at a higher rate so yeah I guess if they do do them long term I wouldn't want there to be a no trade or no movement on there because that's what's going to hamper us exactly um and lastly the last thing about Hamilton before we kind of talk about the rest of the draft how do you think Hamilton's contract is going to affect the renewal of Giordano's contract well, I think there's less onus on the Flames to go super long-term on Giordano. Like, once his contract kicks in, is going to be 33. So, I would expect no more than three or four years on Giordano. Whereas, if they didn't have Hamilton, they might have gone four or five, or maybe longer. Yeah, Giordano this year is coming into his last year of his contract in the uh, 20... What is it? 2015-2016... Um, oh no, he has next year too, right? Yeah. So he's at four million a year, and then he'll be UFA. So you're right. I think he's he's an older guy, so I think that they'll probably be able to get him for less money in shorter term. But I think that to me, the Dougie Hamilton contract is going to establish the new high for the team. Um, I think we'll probably re up Geo about the same price. I could see uh, like a four year seven point five for Giordano. I think that would be the max dollars for him. I'm not sure though. Yeah, we'll see. But I I definitely think that whatever Hamilton gets, I don't think Gio would get more than that, considering Hamilton's supposed to be the future. Well, it depends. Like everything. Uh, like I wouldn't be offended if the Flames gave him like eight or nine, it, depending on how long the term is. So. It, everything, it just depends on 
what the final numbers are, and uh, we won't know until the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. So that's something to look out for. I would think that that deal is probably going to be done before July 1st uh, between the Flames and Hamilton, but we'll find out. We have just over a day to go to get that deal done. Yeah, and even if he goes into RFA period, I don't see any team signing him just because of the fact that like it, it would take more than seven million to lure him away, and uh, that's multiple first round picks. Well, even then, I think we would match even that kind of a a deal. Yeah. So yeah, like it, it's different. Like when uh, Shea Weber was uh, signed by Philadelphia, and like they heavily front loaded that, but. That was a different circumstance, and like they were willing to give four first round picks. I don't see a team out there that's willing to give four for Hamilton. And if they do, honestly, you let Hamilton go because four first round picks, you just go sign somebody else for the money that you're going to give Hamilton. And thank you, we just traded a first and two seconds for four firsts. Yeah, exactly. And you either draft those first or you use them as currency that you didn't have before. Exactly. And either way, it's a win win. And you also have to remember that uh, teams are only allowed, like, five years on RFA contracts because that's how much it's averaged out to. So, like, say you offered, like, $5 million a year over seven years, which is the max, that would actually be divided by five. So it would be 35 divided by five, not 35 divided by seven. So it, that would inflate things as well. Interesting. Well, any last thoughts on Hamilton before we move back to the rest of the draft? No, other than the fact that that trade will likely end up either getting the Flames to the Stanley Cup Finals in coming seasons or win us the Stanley Cup. I hope so. I thought it was interesting, too, that uh, we'd heard throughout the day rumors and stuff from McKenzie and other sources that um, many teams were in on Hamilton, and it seemed like Calgary just swooped in under the radar and just kind of won the sweepstakes last minute. Yeah. Well, I think the Oilers made a better offer than the Flames, but because it's Peter Torelli who was just fired from Boston, I think that the new management basically told him to stick it. Calgary gave a similar offer, so hey, let's doubly screw him by not giving him the player and trade him to their worse than most fierce rival. Exactly. Yeah, I have a feeling Torelli was probably in on Lucic as well, just because it's probably a player he's very familiar with. Well, actually, there is talk that they what they did make an offer on him as well, which they okay. then sent him to another rival of the Oilers <laughs> in there the LA go. Kings. So <laughs> screw him over twice. <laughs> exactly. So going back to the draft table, then, if you're watching the draft on Friday night, which now I'm glad I didn't make time to do, because our Flames would not have drafted. Um, they did not draft in the in the first round, and they did not draft until uh, the 53rd pick, which was their... That's the pick they got from Washington, right? Uh, no, it was the Berchi pick. Okay, so that's the Vancouver pick. And so with their first pick of the day, they picked uh, Rasmus Anderson, a defenseman. Uh, quite a highly ranked defenseman. Um, he, for those that don't know, he's 18 years old. He's six foot, 182 pounds. Matt, do you want to give us just a little bit of info about uh, Anderson and what people can expect from him? Yes, uh, his older brother plays for is a prospect that was drafted by the Rangers, and he had a late growth spurt. So the fact that Anderson's only six foot now, he might not stick at that height. Um, he was a near point per game player in the Ontario Hockey League for the Barry Colts. Uh, I do believe he scored 62 points th this past season. He has a rocket of a shot. He actually has the third hardest shot of anybody in the draft. So that's very good. And the Flames don't have a lot of hard shooting players in their system at all. Uh, one thing that is a bit of a concern and probably the reason why he fell to 53 instead of being a first round pick is that he had the second worst physical results from the combine. Only a guy from Gatineau or Sherbrooke or one of the QMJHL teams had a worse like VO2 max and like all the other testing than Anderson. So if, uh, the... Ryan Van Aston can work with him to get him in shape. 
that then the, that pick will be a home run. Yeah, TSN had rated um, Anderson at 31 on their list, so they thought that he was going to go probably first round, early second round. Um, I'd seen him listed as high as about 28 on some lists. So, you know, the fact that a guy who's that high fell to 53rd, I'm okay to take a little bit of a risk at that pick. Yeah, and the fact that, like, he is has bad conditioning, that's pretty much the easiest thing that you can work with. And he's a good two-way offensive defenseman. He does play decently in his own zone. He's not, like, a super defensive defenseman, but that can be taught as well. I've actually seen him compared to Dennis Weidman as an NHL comparable. Yeah, exactly. That's solid, but not great defensively. He's mostly there because he can really rifle that puck. So the Flames made that pick, and then they were pretty much set to sit back and relax until round three. But shortly after that, they made yet another trade, their second trade of the day, where they traded their... 76th overall and 83rd overall picks, they're two third round picks, one of which was ours, and one we acquired from Washington in the Glen Cross deal, to Arizona to move up in the draft. I think we're the only team that moved up in the draft this year, and we got another second round pick at pick 60, which is a pick that I'm super happy that we made. We were able to, at pick 60, take another Swedish defenseman, 18-year-old Oliver Shillington, uh, who's Again, six foot and 183 pounds. Um, I'm surprised that he was even available. Yeah, and for those that are confused about how to pronounce his name, in Swedish, uh, the letter K followed by a vowel means it's Schilling, or S-H sound. So that's Schillington instead of Kylington. It looks like Kylington, but it should be Schillington. Yeah, and in our uh, draft preview episodes, like I was actually talking him up to be a contender for the 15th overall pick. So the uh, I think I even said it was a no-brainer if his issues were not a big deal. So the fact that they managed to get him at 60 is beyond a home run for me. Yeah, he was ranked number 24 overall by TSN, 29th by Hockey Prospects, 6th uh, among European skaters by NHL Central Scouting. So... This is a guy who was quite highly regarded, and I think it makes sense for the Flames to trade up to get him if he was still on the board. Um, Matt, why do you think he fell to 60? Uh, apparently, he did not interview well, and that's mainly because he's rather cocky and very sure of himself, which, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, other than that, like he did have a bad season, but he did get plagued with injuries all year so who knows uh he is a bit of a project defensively but his offensive skill is off the charts he's probably the best raw offensive player on the blue line other than maybe Mitchell Vanda Sumpel who was taken by the Islanders in the third round other than that like he's just a dynamite offensive player if he can sort out his defensive side where he's even average he'll be a top tier NHL player so if you take a look at the first three rounds then we didn't pick in round one we only made one pick in round two and actually two picks in round two and none in round three after two rounds the Flames now have Hamilton Anderson and Kylan and Shillington on the blue line to me our defense just got a hundred times better in terms of the depth in the in the cupboard put it this way that was the the biggest weakness on the flames and similar to how the center position was such a weakness prior to 2012 and then 2013 and then 2014 now the defense is probably the strongest part of the flame system yeah and and like you said both i think both these defensemen are a bit of a project um but at the 53rd and 60th pick i think we can afford for them to be oh yeah exactly like if either of them figures out the defensive side enough where they're even just passable defensively they're going to be top tier players so there's absolutely no concern in terms of teaching them how to be offensively they both know how to generate offense it's just figuring out if they are able to translate their skills defensively as well and be good at both ends so i'm glad to see the flames really went hard on the blue line early in the draft 
The next pick they made was the 130th pick in the fourth round where they brought in a player very familiar to Calgary. It was Pavel Karnikov from the Hitmen. Uh, he's played center most of the year and a guy who they've probably seen a lot of and he's seen a lot of the Flames. Uh, any thoughts on this pick, Matt? There's a lot of solid upside with him. He's a bit raw. He was playing a more of a depth role in Calgary with the Hitmen. Uh, he's going to be a first line player next year uh, in with the Hitmen, and we'll see. Uh, there's a lot of raw offensive talent there. It uh, some comparisons to Curtis Glencross. I've heard those. Yeah. So. We'll see. And I've never seen him play personally myself, so I'm not overly familiar with him. But it will give us some excuses to go watch a Hitman game or two this year. A uh, depth guy who got 42 points at the, at the WHL level is pretty good. He's 6'1", 196 pounds. Yeah, he's he's definitely not a big boy, but not a small guy either. Um Matt, what, do you think that he has the upside to make it as a as a regular NHL, or do you think we have a AHL guy here? As far as I know, based off of logic, like it being a fifth round pick, he'll more likely be a solid AHL player. But who knows? Uh, he's been labeled as very inconsistent and like some nights he is just absolutely dynamite and takes over a game other nights he's completely invisible if he can get consistency which is a huge issue with a whole lot of players that are 18 and become an offensive player then sure why not he does have some talent and you know it's just one of those things that you have to wait and see in two or three years we'll be able to have a better read on what he is as a player one of the things i think is really going to help him is the fact that he's in calgary so the flame staff is going to be able to access him a lot easier give him more assessments easier that sort of thing um, and I think that might help him stay on track and maybe develop quicker than he would have if he was playing in some, you know, foreign land or even a team that's farther away than Calgary. Yeah, exactly. Like he could even work out with the Flames as well, because you're in the same building. Why not? So who knows? We'll see. And the next guy the Flames took in round six with the 166th overall pick was uh, a left wing and centerman from the Barry Colts. He's 5'10", 161 pounds, and that was Andrew Monjapan. And uh, a guy that I don't know a lot about, what do you know about Monjapan? Uh, he's a very high-scoring player in Barry. He had 104 points this last year. Yeah, he's an overage player. Uh, he was eligible last year, and he's one of the top offensive players. And he's a very early birthday in terms of the draft like if he was a couple weeks older then he would have been just available this year not last year yeah because he got passed over in the draft last year didn't he yeah but if he was a little older he would have been this year so he was one of the youngest players last year now he's one of the oldest this year there's a lot of skill there obviously you don't put up 100 points in juniors if you're devoid of talent especially in the ohl He's a little undersized, but who knows? He could be the next Tyler Johnson, or he could just be a solid AHL scorer like Bryce Cameron a couple years ago. So who knows? This is a guy, based on what I've seen and what I've read about him, who could be a dark horse. He could almost be the next Josh Juris, the guy who comes out of nowhere, really develops, and we go, what? where did this guy come from? And, you know, having a player whose name translates to eat bread is always funny, so... So, Monjapan is eat bread in what language? Italian. Okay. So... This is a guy who takes in a lot of carbs. Yes. Which is not necessarily a bad thing for a hockey player. Uh, so the next player, the last pick the Flames made, was at 196, and they took another defenseman, Riley Bruce. Bruce is six foot six, 194 pounds. Uh, he's an Ontario boy, and he's 17, so he's a younger player in the draft. Last year he played for North Bay of the OHL, and he played 52 games and only had three points. 
Uh, what do we know about Riley Bruce? Absolutely nothing, <laughs> honestly. I, I've i been looking around online and can't find much about him either. Yeah, I've never seen him play to my recollection, or if I did, I was not paying any attention to him. So I can't really comment other than he's another big defenseman, and I'll be able to give a better read on him next week when we go to the development camp and actually get to see him in person the best i guess information i can find about him is on eliteprospects.com and there uh one of their scouts said bruce is purely a defensive defenseman being 6'6 he uses long reach and strength to take care of his own end and clear the crease he does not have much offense to his game and is not the smoothest skater but is a smart defenseman who knows how to use his size so at, you know, seventh round, there's a guy I would not expect to be making the NHL, but if he even makes it, you know, to a career AHLer, I think we got a good pick out of this one. Yeah. And realistically, Stockton, or if the Stockton uh, Heat move again. <laughs> I was going to say, by the time he goes pro, they'll probably move twice. Yeah. Uh, he wouldn't be a bad player to have as a defensive player there. Not a fan of taking players that have low upside like Bruce, but it is what it is. Well, in the seventh round, I don't think you're going to find a lot of players with a huge upside. Well, I'd rather take a flyer on somebody that has at least some offensive skill that might be able to figure out things, but one can't complain with how the, like, that's the only player that the Flames drafted that I'm like, eh. So I, we'll see. I don't know who was I don't know who was on the board at that point. I didn't really you know do a lot of research into the guys at seventh, but I was almost expecting with the Flames taking two defensemen early on, and with a couple of goalies turning pro this year, they might have used their seventh round pick on a goaltender. Well, the problem with that is that like everybody it seemed took goaltender. I think there was like fifteen, eighteen goalies taken this year, so. I don't know as if there was anybody even remotely good left. Like, it was getting to the point where, do you have pads? Good, we'll draft you. <laughs> so I've put them on before in street hockey. All right, you're a man. No longer centerman. Figure out the goalie position over the next two weeks. Yep. <laughs> so besides the Dougie Hamilton trade, uh, the Flames trading their two third-round picks and moving up, what, what, what is your thought on that dra- on that move? I I can't complain with either. They were very good options in both cases, so I have no problem with the Flames dealing the draft picks to get who they got. And I think this is why having more draft picks is always a good thing because you can use them for currency. You know, we I was not expecting them to move two third round picks, but the fact that they did and were able to get a guy who arguably fell, you know, way lower than he should have, it gives you that currency to be able to play with. Yeah, and if you look at it, like both the Anderson and Kylington or Shillington were uh, rated to be in either the first late first round or early second round, and with the Flames dealing our first four Hamilton and two seconds to get two guys that were more or less rated to be in that range of the early second or late first. Like, that just helps to offset some of the talent lost from that trade. Exactly. It's not as though we got, you know, Hamilton and some mediocre guys. I would say we got Hamilton and still almost two first-round picks out of it. Yeah. Well, like, some Boston fans actually think that the Flames got better players than the players that they selected with their three picks that they got from us so yeah they made some kind of weird choices yeah and it's not like they got bad players Zachary Seneshin uh, Jack uh, uh, Forsbacka Carlson and Jeremy Lazon are all three players that I was hoping that the Flames would draft you know not Seneshin in the first round but yeah. yeah that one was kind of surprising that they traded us for the 15th pick and they took Seneshin yeah it's one of those things that they obviously really like them. And I I think all three of those players will actually develop into NHL players for them. I just don't know as if they'll get anybody with the same upside that Hamilton does. Yeah. And I thought it was kind of neat that the Boston Bruins got to pick three times in a row. 
in the first round. Yeah, the last time that happened was Montreal in the 60s, if I recall correctly. So I don't know. I, I thought that there was a time when Colorado, uh, when they first came in, they drafted like four times in a row or something. Uh, they drafted four times in the first round, but not in a row. Oh, okay. Yeah, if I recall, that was Tangay, Scott Parker, Martin Skula, and Robin Regeer. I think Deadmarsh was in there, wasn't he? No, he was already in the NHL. Oh, okay. So, overall, looking back at this year and what we get if we include Dougie Hamilton and, you know, the 53rd and 60th pick almost being first-round guys, I can't think of the last time the Flames had such a great draft day. Can you? The only one is uh, the 2013 draft with getting Monaghan, Poirier, and Klimchuk. That's yeah. the only one that's even remotely close. And it's been a long time since we've seen the Flames do a blockbuster deal, much less a blockbuster at the draft. And I really think that those three players, um, Hamilton, Anderson, and Shillington, are really going to reshape this whole team's future. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. And the fact that the Flames now have five guys on the blue line in terms of prospects between Anderson, Kylington, Morrison, Hickey, and Watherspoon that all look like they will develop into NHL caliber players. Like that takes a lot of pressure off of the team itself to worry about, Oh, well we really need defensemen. Now they, they have enough in the stables that they can focus on other things like restocking the center position and getting some right wingers. Yeah. And I, and I think that not only is it kind of taking the pressure off some of the prospects, but knowing that Hamilton is now there come training camp, it's going to make, as we saw with the fours last year, it's going to make earning a spot on the Flames' blue line that much harder. And so I think we're going to have to see the defensive prospects playing that much better in order to get one. Yeah. And, you know, it will likely what will happen is after this season, you might see a couple of players like say a Dennis Weidman who has a higher contract getting moved out or England or Smead just to make room both in terms of the cap and to open a spot or two. Yeah. We'll we'll see how it shakes down, but I think that's also going to depend on what we think from our pipeline if we got guys that are ready to go or not. Exactly. Like who knows, maybe Watherspoon and Morrison have a bad year this year and you know you don't know um unless there's anything else you want to chat about with the draft i figure we should move on to the news from today and the rfa offers sounds like a plan the flames had a whole ton of restricted free agents and for those that don't know a restricted free agent is one who as long as the team gives them a qualifying offer which i believe has to be 10 percent more money than what they made last year the team retains that player's rights. That player can't go to any other NHL team unless we either deal them their rights or they're given an offer sheet. And so the Flames finally went through and gave RFA offer sheets to 12 players, and those players are Lance Boma, no surprise, Dougie Hamilton, no surprise, Drew Shore, David Wolf, Josh Juris, Michael Furland, Bryce Van Brabrandt, Kenny Agostino, Paul Byron, Max Reinhardt, and Bill Arnold. They had three players who were eligible to be restricted who they did not qualify. Sinak Olatsi, Ben Hanowski, and John Ramage were not given offers, which means they will become unrestricted free agents on July 1st. Matt, of the guys that got offers, any that surprised you? Uh, probably the only one that stands out is Bryce Van Brabant, just because of the fact that he's just a, more of a depth player on Adirondack this year. And he'll likely be the same next year. Not really surprised with any of the people that were not given offers. Akalatsi and Ramage are both solid AHL defensemen, but the Flames do have kind of a log jam in Stockton with defensemen now. And Henowski, he's solid. I wouldn't even mind if the Flames offered him an AHL deal next year. But it's no loss if he does end up walking away as a UFA. See, when I look at this list, I probably would have qualified Hanowski and not qualified Van Brabrandt. 
I think that if I look at guys that I'd want to sign to an AHL deal that are probably going to be up, um, even a more of a veteran guy like an Eric O'Dell or a Bobby Butler, Dustin Jeffrey, there's lots of AHL guys who I would bring in instead of Van Brabrandt. And I think that maybe it's me as a Flames fan and kind of looking at the return on the Jerome McGinley deal, but I guess I'm just, I feel like we can't give up on Hanowski yet. Yeah, I am i don't really care that much uh it it is what it is and we still have augustino and klimchuk from that deal so i'm not really heartbroken if the flames do walk away entirely from hanowski it is what it is i'm not surprised to see arnold reinhardt or um either of them back I'm a little bit surprised to see Paul Byron got, got an RFA offer. I mean, you know, why not retain the rights? We'll see if he gets signed. But I honestly don't think that Byron will be back in a flaming sea next year. What do you think? Actually, I have the opposite opinion. I think that he actually earned a contract. He's a basically the perfect 13th, 14th guy because of the fact that he can play really well on the penalty kill. He is fast. He does generate some offense. He does everything that you need from a extra guy. You know, if he was a six foot tall player instead of a five seven guy, he probably would be a full time NHL player. So, like, if I had to pick, like, all things being equal between Mason Raymond and Paul Byron, I would keep Paul Byron. So, it's a good way to look at it. You know, it is what it is. I like him. I wish that uh, the Flames could move out a player or two to accommodate some of the prospects like Raymond, but that's something that will unfold as the summer goes on. And I think that we could both agree that Drew Shore, David Wolf, Josh Juris, and Michael Furland have all earned their contracts. Oh, yes, for sure. I think that they'll all be signed and they'll all be back in the organization next year. Yeah, and they'll be in Calgary. Well, maybe not David Wolf, but the other three are all waiver eligible this year, so they can't get sent down without having to pass through waivers, and they will get claimed, all three of them. Yeah, they would. So they are going to be full-time NHL players. I think David Wolf for me, I wasn't high on him, as you might remember, at last year's training camp, but I think he's really grown on me and shown a great deal of growth in his game. So I think it's worth giving him at least another year or two. Uh, he will only sign a one-year deal with the Flames, but I think he's definitely earned another contract. It, we have to hope that he can get faster. Like I think that was the main thing that was his drawback was that he's not especially quick, and if he can, then you've got both Wolf and Furland, who are both big banging forwards, that are more than willing to throw hits around. So I'm hoping that he does improve, and maybe he'll be McGratton's replacement this year. Who knows? I could also see Wolf holding down that 13th forward spot. So could I. Um, and part of the reason I'm not sure, I, I didn't clarify this earlier, but part of the reason I'm not sure Byron will be back in Calgary is I think he might be used as a bargaining chip somewhere. That's entirely possible. I also think that this will be Max Reinhardt's last deal with the Flames. I think that he's fallen enough, and I've talked about this all season, but I think he's fallen far enough down the depth chart. It's going to be time to move him out and get some value for him. Well... With him, it's one of those things that you give him one last shot. and I, Yeah, I, give, give him a two- or three-year deal. Give him one year to prove himself, and if he doesn't, move him. Yeah, and he did have a really terrible start to last season, but around December-ish, he figured it out. So you have to give him another shot to see if like what he did in the second half of the season will continue on and if he can establish himself as an NHL player. And if he can't come to camp and win a spot, then I think you start to look at moving him or just placing him on waivers, and if he gets claimed, oh well. Well, I mean, to me, I think that there's still value in him. I think that there's some team that would say, yeah, he's small and, you know, he's still young enough, or they want to collect all the Reinhardts or something like that, and I think there's still some value in him to move him. For sure. 
Um, and I think outside of Dougie Hamilton, the guy on this list who, no surprise that he got qualified, and I think the guy who's going to get the biggest raise is Lance Boma. For sure. What do you think we're looking at for Boma in terms of uh, contract? I wouldn't be shocked if it was a three-year, two, two-and-a-half mil contract once everything's sorted out. I agree with you, but I think to me, Boma's shown us once that he knows what he's doing. And I think to me, I'd almost, I'd cap it about 1.7 if I could get away with it with the Flames and tell him, you know what, let's do a short term, two, three years of 1.7. Show us you can keep doing what you're doing and then we will um, give you a, a better deal after that. Can't complain with that reasoning and I'm sure that's what they're negotiating with. Yeah. And, you know, like last year, I wouldn't have said, oh, yeah, this guy deserves $2 million. He came out and had a great season, and I would just hate to be hampered by that contract later on. Yeah. Well, I don't think that Boma at $2 million is even a, a bad deal necessarily. Like, if you look at Brandon Prust, I think he's making two and a half, and he doesn't have the offensive talent that Boma showed this year. So, we'll see. Yeah, I think that that's probably um, exactly the contract that Boma's camp is going to look at and say, well, look at what he's making. But I don't know, to me, and I've always said this, is prove it to me more than once. That's always been kind of my my way of looking at things. Especially on a good Calgary team that wasn't expected to do a lot. Um, you know, you had a great season. Fantastic. Get us to the playoffs again. Yeah. Well, plus I think uh, he's due for a raise just from all the shot blocking that he did this year. Yeah, either that or a better uh, better set of shin pads he can buy with his raise. Exactly. The one guy that I'm sort of interested in uh, that they didn't qualify is John Ramage. He was a Flames draft pick in 2010. He was drafted in round 403rd overall. Um, he just he hasn't really developed all that well. Do you think that Ramage will get signed as a UFA by another team? Yeah. Or do you think there's a guy who's destined to be a lower league guy? I think he will get signed by somebody. I just don't see it being us, just due to the fact that the Flames have too many bodies on the blue line in Stockton. Like even this past season, we had like nine or ten guys, and like we had to rotate them through. Yeah, I think Ramage just odd man out. Yeah. Like, I could see Stevenson and, like, Yonkman's already gone, so, like, I think the Flames are going to be clearing out a few more bodies just to allow the kids that are going to be in Stockton to actually play regularly instead of having, like, to take every other game off. Yeah, no, I can see that. And if Ramage is still unsigned come main camp, I would not be opposed to giving them a tryout deal. Sure. Like, even if they signed him to an AHL contract, I wouldn't mind that either. So, it, we'll have to see. I I just don't... I wouldn't have wanted them to give him another contract just because I don't think he elevated his game beyond what it was last year to what it was at the end of this year. Yeah, I think that there was some unmet expectations with Ramage this year. Yeah, he was solid, but not doing anything spectacular enough to warrant anything more than what he is getting. And especially at the beginning of the year, I think if you look at the Adirondack roster and the defensemen, there was a ability for somebody to step in and take the reins from somebody like Seeloff who just wasn't playing up to expectations. And I thought that might have been Ramage that did it. And he just didn't jump on and see some of those opportunities he was given all year. Mm-hmm. And I think it was nice of the Flames to give him an NHL game at the end of the season as like a thank you, more or less, for being in the organization for as long as he was. And I think that was like the thank you and goodbye type of thing. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Yeah, I don't, I don't think we've seen the last of this guy. I think that he probably will get signed by some team at the NHL level. And I think that he will probably make the NHL at some point. Yeah, I could see him basically being um, like Dave, the defensive version of David Vandergulik, bouncing up and down regularly for a few years, and then that's it. Yeah, and then going and maybe making his name in Europe after that. Who knows? Exactly. Well, if we move on from the RFAs, the other thing that we have is the unrestricted free agents. And July 1st is, as they call it, the free agent frenzy. Um 
why don't we talk first about the players that the Flames will be losing uh, pending some big deal over the next 24 hours. And the Flames right now are set to lose to unrestricted free agency Kari Ramo, Brian McGratton, Devin Setaguchi, Rafael Diaz, Corey Potter, Dave Schlemko, Mark Kandari, and Brad Teason. So, Matt, why don't we go through these guys one at a time. Uh, Kerry Ramo, you think they're going to get a deal done? No, I, I don't see the need. Uh, having Hiller under contract for next year, Ordeo's going to need to remain in Calgary. I don't see the need. Like, if they were to have traded Hiller at the draft or today or tomorrow, then maybe you keep Ramo, but I, they haven't traded Hiller thus far, so I don't see the need to offer Ramo a contract. That was the other thing I was looking at was, um, yeah, are they going to trade one of the goaltenders at the draft? And the interesting thing was apparently the Flames were actually in on some goalie trades, like the Cam Talbot trade. Yeah, but perhaps that was just a smokescreen to bump the price up, maybe. Yeah, who knows? Maybe we uh, we provide a smoke screen there, and somebody else provide a smoke screen for us on the Hamilton deal. Yeah, well, maybe you get them thinking that you're going after Talbot. Meanwhile, you're wanting to use those assets for Hamilton. It... Could be. Um, what about Brian McGratton? You think that his career's done? Yeah, pretty much. I I don't see him being quick enough to be anything more than the five minute a game fighter type and. Yeah, I think it's pretty much the end of the road. He might get an AHL contract somewhere, but I don't think he'll be donning an NHL jersey again. I think we're going to see McGradden retire this summer, and I wouldn't be surprised if we see somewhere within the three Flames teams in the organization, the NHL, the AHL, and the ECHL, that we see him pop up there in the in the office. Yeah, and I would like that quite a lot. I think he's the right type of character to have in an organization. Next guy, Devin Setaguchi, you think he gets an NHL deal? I think he's going to be a European superstar. It's probably about right. We gave him a second chance and he blew that, so I don't think he's going to get a third chance. No. Uh, do you think Rafael Diaz will get an NHL deal? Probably somewhere much in the same manner that he did this year. He played all right. He's a good seventh defenseman, but nothing more than that. Corey Potter was not a guy who was really expected to be here for more than one year. He was brought in sort of his AHL depth, so I'm not surprised to see him let go. Yeah, and I think it, it'll be the same story with him, uh, an emergency depth guy, basically. I'm surprised that Dave Schlemko doesn't have a deal done yet. Do you think the Flames will let it go to July 1st and take their chances, or do you think we'll see him locked up in the next 24 hours here? I like Schlemko, uh, and if the Flames didn't acquire Hamilton, I think he would have been signed, but getting Hamilton, uh, where do you stick Schlemko? It, and especially if the Flames target somebody in UFA, uh, that would make him like the 8th or ninth guy. And I don't know as if Schlemko would want to sign here with the amount of depth that the Flames na now have. Yeah, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, he seemed like he was pretty happy here. Um, it was hardly seemed like he got you know good good play out of him. So we'll see. I would be I'd be a little bit disappointed if we lost Schlemko because I do think he'd be a good seven eight guy. Yeah, uh, it's one of those things that if the Flames sign him, I'll be thrilled. But if they don't, I can understand why they didn't. Considering we got him for nothing, losing him for nothing is no big deal. Exactly. You know, if we'd paid a price for him, I'd be a little bit more upset about that. Um, but I think he might also, his decision might also be waiting on Laddie Smead and see what happens there. I can see that. Uh, the next guy is a guy that I've been very critical of for the last, at least a season, is Mark Kandari, who we got in the Jay Bowmeister deal. Um, the way I look at it is it's time for Kandari to move on. It just hasn't worked out here in Calgary. Yep, another European superstar in the making. Yeah, he didn't really work out with uh, the Blues. He didn't work out here. I think that there's a lot of lost potential on Mark Kandari. And, yeah, I think you're right. He'll probably end up uh, moving on to Europe or maybe staying in North America in some lower leagues. I could see him being a good veteran ECHL guy or even getting an AHL deal somewhere, just not here. I think it's just time for him to move on. He's only 25, 
So there might be some group that says, yeah, let's bring him in and give him another shot. And the last guy on the list is uh, backup goaltender who the Flames brought in last season, Brad Teason. And we saw a little bit of teasing this season. What do you think of uh, of them letting him go? Yeah, he's just an interchangeable AHL goaltender. I don't see any requirement on keeping him. Honestly, with guys like that, I prefer switching him up every year just because you might find somebody that actually has potential that didn't quite put it all together. And I think, I think too, with the Flames probably changing their starting goalie in AHL next year, it's probably good to get a different backup to work with that guy and complement the new goaltender there. Exactly, because like Thiessen's more of a standard goaltender and maybe having a more of an athletic guy next year because Gillies is more of a bigger guy, having a more active backup might be a good thing to give different looks. I think that Teason definitely went above and beyond what was expected of him this year at the AHL level, especially when Ordeo got called up for a bit. Um, so I definitely think that he has played himself into a spot where a team will want him on their AHL roster. For sure. Even as a backup. Oh yeah, he's not a bad AHL goaltender by any stretch. It's just we don't need one, and we could probably get a different guy, whomever that would be. So n- not not a concern one way or the other. You're talking an AHL guy. Yeah, and I think to me the difference there, um, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in just a minute, but I think that last year we really had Yoni Ordeo as the younger guy in Teason, sort of as the as the older backup guy. And I think that with Gillies probably looking to be the starter, we might want to get a more experienced backup, someone like a Jason LaBarbera or Mike McKenna or somebody like that who can provide a little bit more mentorship. Yeah, or even a guy like Joey McDonald or someone like that. Yeah, I don't know if McDonald's going to be coming back. We'll see. Um, but with that in mind, why don't we jump into talking a little bit more about UFA season now that we know who we're losing. Um, Matt, who do you hope that the Flames are going to target come July 1st? Well, when I look at the Flames roster, there are three weaknesses, if you, you know, air quotes. not They're not major concerns, but if you could find an improvement there, you should do it. Uh, the first one is at the second line right wing. I... I like Joe Colborn, but I just don't see him being quite good enough for that spot. And I think if the Flames could get someone that's just a little better, that that would be a good idea. Uh, For me, the number four defenseman might be a spot to upgrade, uh, especially if, depending on who is available. Like, there are about ten good defensemen this year in UFA. So if you can get somebody that's decent for not a huge contract, that would be a good idea. Uh, And starting goaltender. But again, there's not really anybody in UFA that's worthwhile. So I know in the past you mentioned Cody Franzen as a potential uh, defensive prospect for the Flames to go after. Do you think that with Hamilton being here and probably being the number three guy now that it might be less attractive for Cody Franzen at this point, or do you think maybe more attractive? I think it would actually be more attractive because of the fact that he would be playing with, likely would be playing with Hamilton. And I think that's the case with any of the UFAs. And like even guys like Paul Martin or Johnny Oduya, Andre Sekera, you know, there's a lot of good, talented guys. And I, I would expect that they would be looking at Calgary and saying, well, if I sign there, I'm likely going to be playing with a very good young player. So that would be beneficial as well. It's not the end of the world if the Flames go with Derek England as the number four. It's just the thing I'm most concerned about is what happens if injuries become a problem again like this year. And I would rather have England being the seventh guy and you know, having six really dynamite defensemen instead of hoping that nobody gets hurt. Yeah, and if you look at the defensemen this year, there's really only, I think, one 
must have guy if you're looking to make the and you know if you're looking for the top end and that's Mike Green who realistically I think will stay away from um but yeah I think the Franzen would be a good idea I think even someone like Johnny Oduya could be an interesting pick um as I've been looking at this list you know I've even thought that maybe uh, Andre Mezaros from Buffalo could fit in there well. Yeah, Christian Erhoff or Paul Martin. Erhoff would be a bit of an older guy, which could be good sort of as a mentor. Um, and I think that there's enough sort of three, four, five defensemen on this list who the Flames could bring in at not too much money. Exactly. And term is the most important thing. Like, I wouldn't want them spending more than $5 million a year on any prospective guy. No. But if you can get, say, like Oduya or whomever for, like, say, three years at, like, 4.5 or something, I that would be a good way to make sure that, like, all six of your defensemen are really good players so that way the Flames can push for a Stanley Cup this year instead of just being a very good team. Uh, looking at that right wing position that you were mentioning, I think you're probably right with where we need help. We don't need any help at center. Um, I think that we could use a couple guys who can play right wing and left wing because we saw a bunch of players playing off position last year. Um, but yeah, I think definitely a right winger and defenseman are what I'd be going after. Yeah, and if you look at the options that are available, you got Drew Stafford and Michael Froelich who played with Winnipeg. You'd mentioned earlier that you liked the idea of Justin Williams coming in. Yeah. And Justin Williams with the Kings, you got Martin St. Louis as a possibility. So there are a few options that are available. It would depend on what Will Williams would be my number one choice for that, just because he has the intangibles of being a Conn Smythe winner and the experience of winning a cup. So... You know, it just depends, again, on term and dollars. And of that kind of list, looking at them, I think that uh, Martin San Luis, Drew Stafford, um, Joel Ward, and Justin Williams will probably be the guys that are most contested there, the guys that get the most um, offers. But, yeah, I think that of all those guys, I think Froelich is going to get overpaid, and I wouldn't want to play in that sweepstakes. But I think Justin Williams, you might be able to find that sweet spot between term and dollars he's a bit older too so i think we get a a shorter contract on him yeah i could see william like if williams was willing for like three million three years at six million per i think that would be a solid good contract he's making three million now so doubling his contract i don't see why he wouldn't be willing yeah and i think the best target would actually be the one player that I really dislike on the list, which is Martin St. Louis, because you'd likely only be wanting one year, which in terms of the cap moving forward would probably be the best fit just because you can get rid of him after the one year. Like even if you sign him for $8 million or something ridiculous, it, we have the cap space and you can just walk away after one year. I'm not opposed to that, but I agree that it'd have to be a one year. If it's any more than that, I think we're going to get burned by it. Yeah, I wouldn't want him on two. No, even even a two, you know, I don't think it's worth doing. No, and Stafford, he would be all right. It would just depend on dollars and term, just like for a leak or Joel Ward. Yeah, and going down the list, I mean, there's you know, like I think Danny Heatley is probably done. Um, but there's really not a lot of kind of mid-level guys in this list who you might be able to pick up and do something with. I think you've got kind of the very good and then the not-so-good. Yeah, there's no in-between guys of players that might be able to figure it out and jump up sort of like Hoodler did because, like, Hoodler was more of a middle guy that's emerged. Or even a, like a Glen Cross type. True, and there's not really anybody that's in that range. Yeah, it's... It's kind of a weird list. You've got a lot of guys in this list who I feel like have already had their second chance and haven't figured it out. Um, guys like Steve Bernier, Colton Orr, those kind of guys, David Moss. So it's it's almost like there's a bunch of just filler. David Van Der Gulik, who you mentioned earlier, a lot of just kind of filler in this list. Yeah, and you know, they'll get signed. It's just uh, it wouldn't be an upgrade with what we already have. And I think that the players that we mentioned, the five guys, 
those would be the only guys that would be upgrades on what Colborn would bring as the second line right wing. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. Um, the only other time I could see them potentially signing somebody from that list is for an AHL contract. And uh, if anyone's interested, you can go to you can go to flamesnation.ca and they have a great article about veteran players who the Flames might want to sign for AHL contracts. And a couple names in that list that I thought was kind of interesting, who I wouldn't be opposed to, uh, Dustin Jeffrey. He's 27, but I think that he couldn't fit in well in our system. And maybe even somebody like Manny Malhotra to be the uh, the veteran leadership on that team. Yeah, I could see it. I'm not really overly concerned about the AHL just because the Flames have quite a few bodies that will require playing time, sort of like this past season. So I would more defer to having mostly like our young prospects play instead of AHL veterans just to win. Yeah, I think there's a balance between the two, though. I mean, you know, another name that's in this article that I think is a good idea, I didn't think about it until I, meant, until I read it, was a guy like Davis Drewski, who has been part of a Stanley Cup winning team, um, but could not just be there to play, but be there to show these guys what it means to be a pro athlete and almost be a mentor. I think that can be a bit of an undervalued role at the AHL level. Uh, sure, and like with any prospective veteran player, you'd want, somebody that's been in winning situations ideally so Drewiski what would be a decent player but again it depends on the who what's and where you know what I mean yeah and you also mentioned a goaltender um I'm not convinced that we necessarily need an upgrade there but looking at the f- top free agent goaltenders we've got uh Victor Faust Kerry Ramo Michael Newverth, Josh Harding, and Jonas Gustafsson. Uh, who would you see the Flames bringing in as a starting goalie, or would that be a position they have to trade for? I think they would have to trade for it, but I, if the Flames, say, tomorrow decided to trade Hiller to the Sharks for a fifth-round pick or whatever, just to get him off the books, uh, I of that list, it would probably be Newverth, just because he's been semi-good wherever he's gone. But I at I wouldn't do that. I would just run with Hiller for the year and see what or if Ordeo can steal the job. The other thing is we've seen in the last little bit that um, that Ordeo has had a slow start in the last two seasons. So I think you need somebody like Hiller, who we know will hopefully be ready to go at the beginning to pick up some of that slack. Yeah, and that's why like I, of the guys that you listed, I. Hiller's better than all of them, so I, unless the Flames manage to trade for somebody really dynamite, which I don't see on the market at the moment, I'd just let it rip with what we've got and see later on. I agree. Uh, is there anyone you hope that the Flames don't go anywhere near? Chris Stewart. That's it? Yep, that's the only guy. I really do not like Chris Stewart, and I don't think he fits the persona or drive that the Calgary Flames have, and I just don't want lazy passenger types, and I think he is. So that's the only guy. Um, I'd probably add Steve Downey to that list. From what I've heard, he's not a great team guy. He's not a great locker room guy. And I know I was high on him earlier, but especially with the Dougie Hamilton trade now, I don't think it's worth playing in the Mike Green sweepstakes. No. We kind of filled the role of needing a really dynamite number three, so now it's only, like, if in case it's possible and term and dollars fit, then get a number four guy, but it's, like, way down the list now. Yeah, I'm not expecting come July 1st that we see a Flames move anytime that day. What about you? I could see us signing somebody. I just don't know in what regard that would be. But if the Flames don't make a move, I wouldn't be shocked either. So, Treliving knows what's on the market and what the dollars and term are, so we'll see likely right off the bat if... Like, honestly, I wouldn't see the Flames making a move on July 2nd. It would be, like, pretty much right off the bat on the 1st if they do move, make any moves at all. 
See, I'm kind of thinking that we might not see them make any moves on the first, and it might take till the sixth or seventh or eighth um, to really see them do something. Either way, we'll see. A lot of fun to come this week. So, um, one of the biggest names who it looks like is going to be available as well as Mike Richards. Is there any situation in which you want the Flames to pursue Richards? Uh, honestly, with the Flame center depth, I wouldn't bother. And like, if the Flames managed to find a, a suitor for Matt Stajan and you replaced him with Mike Richards, that might work. But I'd just rather let some other team sign him, and if they get somebody good out of it, that's good for them. Yeah, I think that Mike Richards is still going to be overpaid because um, I think there will be some teams that want to pick him up, and I just don't think it'll be worth playing at whatever he thinks is going to be um, whatever he thinks that dollar value is going to be. Yeah. Like I could, the team that I think he will end up signing for is Toronto just because they need a lot of help. <laughs> and I think that would be the best fit for him. Beyond that, you know, I don't see it being us. So, No, me neither. Um, anything else you want to chat about, Matt? No, it's just been an amazing week as a Flames fan, and I've just been so thrilled with what Treliving accomplished this week. So I'm just looking forward to September and October and can't wait for the next hockey season to start, and hopefully the Flames can push towards being a Stanley Cup contender. Yeah, I agree. I really think that we've seen this team's fortunes change so much over 24 hours, which you generally can't say about a team unless you're losing. It's easy to change your fortunes for the worst by dealing in 24 hours, but it's hard to make the kind of acquisitions that the Flames have made over the over 24 hours like we saw here. Definitely. And like the Flames were looking like they were still going to be a year or two away from being a legit contender, but now with getting Hamilton for nothing off the roster like now it's like okay well that got accelerated let's go (laughs) yeah exactly and i think it also probably gives some maybe some motivation to guys on the roster to see okay the flames are serious about doing this again yeah and that's why i think the flames could be a solid place for ufas like i could see a guy like williams or one of the defensemen wanting to sign here and maybe willing to take a little less term because of the fact that they know that the flames are on the upswing for sure. And that they want to win a cup. Like I could see that happening. So do you think that it, that move alone of, well, I guess not that one move, but the moves that they made at the draft might change their perception to some free agents. Yeah. Well, like if you look back when Chicago was, before they won the cup, like you saw Marion Hosa looking at, okay, who's going to win the cup soon? And he ended up signing with, uh, going from Pittsburgh to Detroit. That didn't work out. And then he went from Detroit and looked and saw that Chicago looked like they were really stepping up and ready to become a contender. And he signed that long-term contract. And I think that the Flames are in very much the same position that Chicago was in 2008, where it's looking like they're going to be a cup-caliber team very soon, and that I could see a whole litany of players saying, well, maybe if I take a year or a couple dollars off of what I'm looking for, maybe I can win a Stanley Cup with that team. Yeah, that's not really a way that I looked at them as comparing them to that Chicago team. But, yeah, definitely an interesting comparison. We'll see. Yeah. At the same time, I think there's a fine balance there of I think we are still in a rebuild, and we have to remember that. So we're not just looking to bulk up on veterans for a run. Oh, no. Like, it, ideally, it would be one forward and one defenseman max. So it's not like we would go out and sign, like, four guys. It would just be like one or two guys max. Yeah, well, we will see what happens, and we will probably be back uh, late next week, the first week of July, probably, I don't know, the maybe the 3rd or 6th, 7th, somewhere in there, um, and we will talk about what happened on July 1st and what we can look forward to with the uh, prospect camp coming up. Yeah, and we will be de- interviewing quite a few of the prospects, at the development camp 
who we are going to talk to hasn't been finalized yet. You'll have that to look forward to, and we'll recap free agency and all that fun. So there's still quite a lot of Flames news coming up in the next couple of weeks. And before we go, I do want to congratulate the winner of our listener survey. For those that have been listening for a while, you've heard me uh, shill it every week, get you guys to take the survey. Uh, Our winner was Kyle Tully. So Kyle, I've already emailed you, but in case you're listening to this, um, we will send off your prize pack sometime this week. So congrats on being randomly selected. Um, and outside of that, we will uh, we'll talk to you next week, Matt. Yeah, take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. and Enjoy the free agent frenzy. Yeah, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is edited by Mike Crosby and Brett Bauer. This show is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license information, visit firesidechat.ca.